Good morning to you, my friends, wherever you may be in the world today. Uh, Alan Clements here from Los Angeles, California, United States of America. Uh, April 19th, 2021. Uh, for those of you who've been tuning in, thank you for tuning in. I've been giving a series of talks now for a number of years. Um, this latest series, um, based upon my new book, Extinction X-Rated, if you have the the radical courage to get it and read it, may you be May you be free enough to go on that journey with me. Uh, I dare not tell the story. It's dramatic. The context is this room in my friend's house, Robert Chartoff and Jenny Chartoff. I married them. He passed away a few years ago. Many of you know of our friendship. He's a renowned film producer. He did all the Rocky movies, the right stuff. He always had that spirit before he passed away with pancreatic cancer uh, to never give up. <laughs> you know, the, the epic Rocky in each of us, the mystical Rocky, the spiritual Rocky, the human Rocky. And uh, to conquer self-doubt, to conquer physical limitations, to challenge cultural, financial predictions of failure, all the things that society and our historical condition, unique as it may be, that wants to interrupt the possibility of, of I would say, with tremendous care, greatness, the achievement of greatness inside and outside. And greatness is a very relative term, isn't it? Emotional greatness, spiritual greatness, just simply the greatness to, to wake up and breathe within this intersecting challenge of, of destiny and choice, the weird sacred destiny of existential conditioning and what appears to be free choice. And the question always at that momentary crossroad, at least in my life at the moment, and it seems to have been that way for some decades and hopefully into the future. What will you do? Now what, right? Sometimes I envy quite openly the lives of those who have lives that are ordered, that have predictable patterns of choice within frameworks of family and intimacy and decency. And I'm not going down the road of mortgages and insurances and birthdays and weddings. But yes, that too. But it's a very rare individual, that, that rad crazy girl in you, that rad crazy madman in me, if you know what I mean, that I would call it with humility, that, that Dharma autistic savant that is just so jagged with the conditions of culture and for me personally of a culture of violence. You know, what do you do? What do you do at the crossroads of today knowing what we know? I have not seen that the Dharma life, the mindful life, the intelligently spiritual life has provided any real modicum <laughs> of hope. There's so many deep benefits that I could share. Those of you who know me, I've shared them. I hope to continue to share them. But that jagged edge of now what? Within that weird destiny, that sacred weird destiny of a planet headed to the brick wall as the environmentalist in Canada has so eloquently and directly, David Suzuki talked about how we as 8 billion humans are driven in a car by our own greed, fear, and delusion. And we're headed for the brick wall. 
the rock wall of self-annihilation called the sixth mass extinction. Tune out, man, right? Tune out the weird sacred destiny. And again, that mad woman in you, the mad man, I like that maverick, that rebel, not the spiritual gangster on the t-shirt or the logo of, of banality, but someone who's so radically out of the box and it's always there, right? Those hip hop artists, those, those, those radical rap artists, those crazy death metal artists, those beautiful poets, yes, the Rumi, yes, all the other greats. They heard something so different and yet so real. And it's always that choice at the crossroads of the moment. What the fuck will I do with the weirdness, the sacred weird destiny of what is true and what I've learned and what I know, what I anticipate and what will I do now? To crack the coma, the predictions, the indoctrinations, the propaganda, the habits, the bullshit regimes that we enact call me working through my addictions me overcoming my personal faults. I mean, for me, the rupture of existential trauma is so vivid, not just today. It's been that way since I was a kid. I don't know about you, but it's like when you really feel it, right? When you feel it, you read the Bible, you read the Tepitaka, you read all these great classics, you read the, the literature of the greats that bleed all over the page, and you really deeply embody the Kafka-esque inherent nature of samsara. God damn, man, it's so weird. It's so weird. The sacred, how do you even dare use that word? That life is inherently sacred, Alan? Why? To wake up in the day and wonder where you're going to get food, how you can avoid persecution and terror and torture as they're doing in the beloved country of Myanmar right now? I've often yelled out in my scream, one rape is one too many. I have to say there's a big part of me today that does not feel, really does not feel that I belong. And yet there's this rah, 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 make it work, turn it in, catalyze. You've got more spiritual work to do, more Dhamma work, right? The radiance of better than the way it is right now. You know? Thank you for letting me rant and rave and get down with you to this wicked moon, this insult of God where it intersects with reality. There's something in me that bleeds and cries and tries to understand here at this weird, sacred destiny of today and making a choice of what to do now. First part, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. I'm really, really dropping in and letting go back to my book again. I kind of lost track because of my rant. Ironically, not necessarily such a interesting topic to some, but it's been fascinating to me. The whole notion of, of rebirth within life, number one, and the opposite of that, or the corollary truth to that is, the, the mindful euthanasia of life and of behaviors, not just taking your life mindfully, but so radically the, the, the suicide of dysfunction. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Committing existential mindful euthanasia of limitation. If that makes sense to you. I mean, if you've ever been on acid high dose and you've been really deeply communing with your hope and your wisdom. And if you've had an ally there, you can possibly interrupt cultural predictions and fears and primordial traits that are so normally inaccessible to the normal at altitudes and the, the geographical contours of the day-to-day -day and even the more stratospheric analogies of high radiant awakening, the insights through deep meditation. Sometimes there's just something that comes through, right? I look at the plants in the yard here where I'm staying and 
the vitalization, despite the odds of being in, what, 50 square miles of urban, everything coming in from the waters of another state, and yet, when I'm really quiet and just tune out, the tangerine trees, the peach trees, the orange trees, the flowers, they have that root system and their leaves and their innate nature feeling the radiance of light. There's just something that's they're there. The leaves fall, there's not a tear. The squirrel eats the orange, goes back to the nest. The hummingbirds come and they move at incredible speed and all of a sudden they just stop and enter their nest. The lessons of living. <laughs> That's why the word enlightenment became so, so empowering to me, especially within the Buddhist tradition that offered a sure heart's release from what the Buddha, as I attribute to the teachings found in these ancient texts, the sure heart's release from dukkha, self-generated suffering as well as contextual complexity that almost intrinsically based upon being embedded in the context of life in dealing with crisis and uncertainty almost at every momentary crossroad of our lives from physical hardships to mental hardships who among us have known or maybe you who have lost aspects of life limb senses imagine going blind right now or losing our ability to listen and hear and by some grace of God, our eyes come back, our ears come back, our limb comes back. Imagine, I can't imagine the weird sacred destiny of losing these hands and fingers. No longer touching in the way that I once know. No longer able to pick up something the way, losing a leg. How many people I've seen at the hospital recently, have, they've left no bottom. It's so weird. It's like, it's so weird to wake up and of course we carry on some don't I've been in refugee camps I think you have too been in war zones I think you may have too people don't get through that stuff very easily it comes back a little bit sometimes to my refuge I'll close with this I keep hearing in my head these last week, especially as I'm listening more carefully at this crossroad of a weird sacred destiny and knowing what to do. I keep hearing Dhamma, Dhamma cure. I know the word cure has intrinsic hope and positive outcomes in it, but the Dhamma approach I don't know that I would have gone overland to India to eventually go to Burma and eventually be blessed to ordain as a monk if I'd had the internet, Wikipedia, and anyone who had done that prior really to that journey. The dacoits, the illness. Imagine someone talking to us about the the, the physical complexity of dengue fever. I don't know if you've ever had it, but it's like, God damn, you know, give me the luxury of wherever I am away from those, you know, flying, killing mosquitoes. And then, of course, those of us have had typhoid or cholera, hepatitis. You might get hepatitis, likely get hepatitis. Okay, I can't wait to navigate my pillow for two hours to move from side to side and have perfectly white stools and have skin the color of deep yellow and have no appetite and unable to move maybe four, six, eight, twelve weeks, all for the sake of the beautiful journey of going across through Turkey and risking incarceration and rape and thievery through 
Iran and Pakistan, blessed India, the pollution, the noise, the unthinkable deformations of life. I remember going to Benares with my partner at the time and just sitting there, standing there in those alleyways, remember that? And just looking at the convulsions of life, thousands of people waiting on these dark alleys for the opportunity to die near the sacred burning guts, near the, the Ganges, with their little bit of money left to buy the wood to burn their body alone. And how many of them are there in sacred awe of their pantheon of goddesses and gods, feeling, weeping, crying into this deep, intercellular, philosophical, transdimensional, karmic, consequential, sacred destiny, and yet always there in the moment, making eye contact with you. And what now? <laughs> Call this excessive meditation dysfunction <laughs> disorder. <laughs> Call this excessive psychedelic insight disorder call this existential awakening, call this the jagged edge of sacred destiny and trying to bring a Dhamma presence, a Dhamma resilience to our lives today. And we're among the lucky ones, right? Most have cars and foods and credit cards and hope and love and hands and tenderness, intimacy. Some have radical sense right now of deep, deep romantic, heightened, spiritualized, ubuntified, erotic relationships that where they can just not forget the world, but just disappear into each other and feel the vessels of God and the goddess intermingling with flesh and fluids and heart and mind and song and dance and states of God and wow creating poetry together. That's cool. If I had something to do tonight, what would I do? I wouldn't dance with the devil any more than when I'm already dancing with you. I would call in the sacred dakinis from within and without and illuminate through joy Rapture, possibly, right? Just speaking extemporaneously, just how to live at that crossroad. Now what? Within sacred destinies that are weird and jagged. Call up and forth the most splendid, imaginative, theatrical, artistic creation, right? Use all obstacles I learned in Burma as catalysts for a new evolution of your relationship to the mystical, to the Dhammic, to the Paramis, to Dhamma, to Vimuti freedom, to Metta, loving kindness. Use everything, young monk. How many times I heard that? Turn every disadvantage, every jagged edge of decision-making and confrontation with crisis and the unexpected. Turn it around. That's the Dhamma cure. That's the Dhamma resilience. Engage it. Your illness, engage it. How many times I heard, although your body's dying all the time, not only not let it touch your mind, elevate, engage, liberate. Elevate, engage it with states of mind that are the conditions to liberate. Isn't that the intelligence of mindfulness? Engage at the crossroads of that jagged edge of sacred destiny, always keeping in mind. Remember for me, Alan, remember for me, Alan, that sati, S-A-T-I, the word in Pali, the only word to describe mindfulness is conscious remembering of that which liberates, not just bare attention to the phenomenology of present time presence, but a whole matrix and 
intersecting set of thoughts and emotions and intelligences that discerns and feels and engages the phenomena with choices that feels, that doesn't grasp, and if it does grasp, it releases to liberate and take the Dhamma radiance higher, the Dhamma cure. And so in conclusion today, as you can see, I'm talking to myself, thank you very much, um, activated how to get healthier and more awakened in the vitality that are trans-supplemental, trans-vitamin-based, trans-dietary-based. Yes, all those things too, but something that even good love becomes better if we engage it, right, with our, our, the wisdom of our Dhamma. And here, right here at this edge for me is innovative release from contorting propagandas and predictable patterns of, of conformity. Conformity to the ideas of scientific data, the conformity to ideas abundance of mind and body and surgery and medicine and spirituality, the pundits that you project into the Bible, the Tapitaka, the Quran, the literature, the Tolstoy, the Rumi. What's true for you? That's what my thing is right now. What's true for me? The Buddha's enlightenment solved his dilemma. The Dhamma is so utterly unique, no two of us will do it alike. Might use the same words, right? But that's the way that I heard it. No two snowflakes, no two fingerprints, no two Buddhas alike, no two yogis alike, no two expressions of a yogic asana alike. Is there a word beyond authenticity that is so liberating to core theology that's where I'm wanting to be right now. Where is their direction within this weird, sacred edge of destiny and choice? I'm listening. That's the takeaway here. I hope you get, if you're interested, is how well do we listen and feel and resonate with, with the fear, with the, and resurrect the courage to intersect with the fear and discern from the information from the people. Keep it simple enough and deeper than instinctual, not negating anything cultural that does make discerning sense or anything medical that does make discerning sense, that anything professional that does make really good sense. Keep in mind all these people who are very well trained in areas beyond yourself, but at the same time intersect with your own deep wonderment, your own deep curiosity, with your own deep Dhamma response. I'll close with a story. I was a young man going to Burma for the Dhamma cure. I needed to look in. I don't know about you. It wasn't going to come from the kiss, the acquisition, the change of environment. And I was introduced to meditation, five postures, sitting, walking, standing, lying down and everything in between. Six senses, obviously the eye, the ear, the nose, the mouth, the body, and the mind door, the sixth. The three avenues of experience, thought, speech, and action. All times, all states, all contexts with the three avenues in the five postures, in the six senses, 
employ Dhamma. It was beautiful. Shaved my head, wore the mahogany robes, listened to the instructions, sitting, walking, standing, moving, eating, doing everything simply by occupying present time presence with present time presence and to feel and to resonate and to learn the nature of one's interior mind that is so easily negated and neglected by outer things. I'm not going to judge it. I don't judge it. But in the nakedness of a yekta, a monastery, or even your own apartment, when you're alone, we have to live with our own mind and body. And how easy it is to move away from that weird, sacred edge of destiny. And our choices become predictable and habitual. And there's very little fidelity in the eroticism of the now. The artistic, creative activism in the now. And so after about two weeks in the monastery, I was so, so claustrophobic, so in conflict. I never really stopped like this before and encountered what I've said so many times, the best kept secret of my life, which was my own identity and my own repressed habitual, unrecognized identities. I'll tell you, you want to come close to the intimacy of the unknown in yourself, slow down. And you'll see this in incessant anatomical existential momentum of cascading experiences, projecting the future through the six senses, through thought, speech, and action. And we live in this avalanche of future. And it's no so groovy to come back to the moment it's one thing to eat that primordial strawberry hanging over a cliff with one hand on a branch with a tiger beneath you. <laughs> it is not just so sweet knowing that death is imminent. Many people have to deal with that strawberry while being raped and dismembered and tortured and terrorized. And some are so sensitive just even being alive or all those things. We can't evaluate other people's sensitivities, their empathies. And after two weeks, I just broke down. I wasn't a real vulnerable young man, generally speaking. I went back to my room in the monastery and just cried. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do one-way ticket. There was no escape that I could see. So I just sat on my bed and cried. And I remember hearing outside my window these dogs, which there were many in the monastery, growling slowly and quietly, then a, a bark. And, but I was triggered. I wanted to cry on my terms, if you know what I mean. So I went outside with my flashlight and looked, and there was a, a mother dog with her litter. And she was just ragged skin and bones and diseased and she had six seven I don't know how many puppies all of them with their eyes closed all of them yearning for the nipple for nutrient for survival and isn't that life isn't that that jagged edge of destiny and choice the primordial instinct to stay alive and to be nurtured by the mother the inherent mother that is no more unless you're a baby. The inherent mother that's in our hearts, that can we feel the primordial breast, the nutrient of the existential source of, of divine feminine vitality? Is that really the saving grace at the crossroads of sacred weird destinies and choices? 
I looked and looked and looked and saw those young little puppies and I imagined me being that puppy. Yet my eyes were wide open and I'm growling for that which I had no access to. My mother, the Divine Mother, the archetypal mother, the divine feminine in this universe inside, often repressed, to just basically say, embrace the tragic, sacred, weird edge of destiny and learn here in this monastery how to nurture, how to nurture, how to nurture yourself, the naked, pure, being of living and dying as frequently as possible and finding within that the metaphorical rebirth. And it was like, wow, I've been meditating for two weeks. I came to Burma to watch my breath and my mind. And I'm having this epiphany by watching these blind yet to see puppies struggle to survive with the mother. And they're growling and they don't even know where these states of mind come from. It's <laughs> so primal, right? Well, I felt for the first time, I would call it an invigoration of my meaning there. I would dare say that it was a bit of a Dhamma epiphany, my first real insight into nature and the inherent complexity of embracing the weird sacred destiny of the moment and employing and having the courage to confront primordial habit with conscious choice, engagement, and liberation from habit from the incessant momentum of predictive behaviors that are better than now, the anticipation of struggles that are worse than now, and just to feel. And I went to Mahasi Seiro, my preceptor and Dhamma teacher, meditation teacher, and I told him, and he closed with this, and he told me that That is a very, very important insight to reclaim, this is my word, to reclaim your fixation on the outer being the cause of your inner. I take that to heart right now. The outer being form, sound, smell, taste, conditions and culture, circumstances. The Dhamma cure is to release, as far as I can see, my fixation on the outer as being that which defines my inner. Yes, some form of contour, some form of, of shaping that goes on from how we interpret outer phenomenology on the six senses through the three avenues of thought, speech, and action. Because those thought, speech, and action avenues are not just external, but they are internal as well. And we always have our cognitive spiritual dhamma or absence of dhamma hands on our own consciousness, right? Sculpting, shaping, distorting, releasing. Who do we want to be in the utter uniqueness of our own trans-identity at the same time as Dhamma identity. We're all fingerprints. We're all snowflakes. Emptiness doesn't mean I am not someone. It means that I can sculpt any form or have habit sculpt me into form. And he said to me, that is a very pivotal insight to proceed down the journey, along the journey of classical Dhamma Vipassana, the classical progress of insight. Because now you know to 
seek as much control as possible at that sacred, weird edge of destiny with choice at that incessant crossroad right now. Call it the carpe diem moment, seizing the opportunity because it could get worse and it will. We will die. We'll get old. There are avalanches inside and around us. I think of one day how the people of Burma celebrated the victory of a democracy coming after years of tyranny, unremitting torture, persecution. And then in one day, February 1st, 2021, a satanic military cult obliterates, tries to obliterate the democracy movement. We talk about <laughs> the sacred, weird destiny and the question of now what? Oh, God. The cruelty of this samsara. And right there, facing the moment. And Mahasi told me a concluding story in that encounter with him at that point in my life. I think it was in 1979. He said, we had a woman once who had never seen the ocean or the bay, the Andaman Sea, the Bay of Bengal. And she took a tour out there and went on a boat. She was so enamored by all the colors of this incredibly exquisite bay and sea, turquoises and blues. My vocabulary fails me about the nuances of ocean colors in the tropics, but if you can imagine it in your eye. And she met upon these people who took her on this tour. They were, they were, they were dacoits, robbers, but not overt robbers. And apparently this was not uncommon, but since she had never seen the ocean was totally virginal, she thought, and it was affirmed by these dacoits, these robbers, that all these colors were intrinsic to the water and that they could be taken out and put into vessels and sold. And so she thought to herself, ah, I'll bring all these colored waters back to me, to the inland of Myanmar, to Burma. And I will gather my friends and talk to them about the beauty of these colors and sell them and develop a system of commerce from the sea to Mandalay. And of course, she paid handsomely, as I was told by Mahasi Sayadaw, for these faux colored water in vessels that were no longer transparent, but they were covered. And of course, as the story concludes, imagine pouring these waters out and seeing that the colors had disappeared. Mahasi told me this story because the phenomenology of life good and bad, right and wrong, life and death, illness and safety are all phantoms on the colorization stream of the ocean of consciousness. They appear to be real. They're as real as a siren going to an emergency. But when you really examine them, young monk, they're primordial, they're phantasms, they're dreams on the cave walls, the sky walls, the ocean walls, whatever the analogy, the metaphors of your own mind. They can't be grasped. And the Buddha taught a teaching to transcend the illusions, the hallucinations, the Dhamma cure, beyond the fixation of the outer and the merging with hallucinations. There's no resolution there. You're extracting yourself from delusion, Agathara 
as he named me. Be like this woman. Abide in the clear waters of consciousness and learn the timeless, mindful art of Satipatthana Vipassana meditation that understands, he said, the colors of consciousness, like the ocean colors. And to know that those colors, what they are, how they manifest, their functions, their proximate causes, their near enemies, how to mix them, knowing nuance, but equally knowing that they sit within clear mind. And to know that clear mind as well as a transparent color of consciousness. And from there, understand what he talked about as causality. Ticha parigaha jnana, the intersecting, interdependent cause and effect causality of all phenomena. Abide in that insight, insight to being a phenomenology, and keep tracing back these insights to that clear ocean and seeing their true characteristic, that of impermanence, that of emptiness of self, and if you fuse with any phantasm, anything whatsoever, if you don't see the conditioned habitual need to fixate on anything outer or anything inner, you will suffer. Transcend all fixation, what's his message? the Dhamma cure. And right there, the weird sacred destiny and the what now. What is a Dhamma cure in our lives? What does the Dhamma mean to us in our lives? And how well do we live in that that courageous artistry that's willing to interrupt the memberships that we have <laughs> to repetitive behaviors, games that we play, thoughts that we think, patterns of behavior, abuse to self or other, speech constellations, tone constellations. Where is the liberty in our souls to look right into the face of illness and old age and death <laughs> and truly bring there the gift of it as catalyst? I think that's what I'm trying to get to today. It's not easy to get out. Seeing catastrophic circumstances as catalysts for heightened conviction in applied Dhamma to engage, to elevate, and to liberate. Why take the catalyst away? So, thank you from my heart today. Thank you for being in my life. Thank you for tuning in. And um, I dare say, if you have the courage, this, 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 I've talked very little about this book and I'm not doing any, and no, no endorsements, no podcasts. It's like the whole thing was based upon why stay alive. And it's, and it's an interior dialogue of 12 hours with myself. It was never meant to be a book. It was, I wanted to get into a kind of Zen meditative retreat for seven months, which I did. And I asked myself, what really matters right now? And this book is the answer I came up with. And it's all about my mind, 
nothing to do with your mind unless it illuminates what I would call is my inner mandala. Everything in it is symbolic. It's not to be taken literal. This word I learned, auto-fictional, it's all a fiction. It's all made up to evoke and to provoke, ignite. How can we stop this, this individual complicity with collective violence? I don't know about you, but it's... I don't like coexisting with violence. It's despicable. And, and then when you are gifted with the opportunity of how to convert totality like a, like a goddess Buddha, what's your method? One meditation breath at a time? Who the hell wants to deal with that level of slow ox cart like evolution? I mean, let's think of like, how can we go into a, of a booth in our city, in our mall, and look into the lens of a new form of artificial intelligence that implants psychically the capacity to courageously overcome all predilections for violence. Uh, sign me up for that vaccine, but not for control. But why do we need to participate in violence? And so this book was my attempt at radical existential trauma conversion therapy and a bit of an autobiographical dance cinematically, because Bob, I will confess with you, Bob, my dear friend, who sat in these chairs in this room with talking to screenwriters and directors and co-producers and actors and actresses on storytelling. And I say this with the degree of of respect for my beloved friend. He thought I was a pretty good storyteller and really encouraged me to, when you, when you write, trust in the flaw. It's not a problem. It's, it's a grace. And speak your mind. No one in this goddamn city of Hollywood tells the truth. Everyone wants to spin and be your friend and make it good and beautiful. And, but man, the, as you know, and as I, the jagged edge of honesty can be so ugly and repulsive. That good story. This is just a small portion of his books and Jenny's books. And so this is, a, this is my story. This is a story I decided to write, should I die and never say it. But I never really intended it to be read, but I documented it through transcripts and spontaneous, oh, my phone, and voice recordings. If you could see my other room, the notes. And so it was written in a cinematic way. It's like, wow, this is what Bob really encouraged, asymmetrical. He's the one who encouraged me to write a film script for him back in 1991, too, when I went through the good graces of a dear friend of mine to the former Yugoslavia, where my desire, the reason I went was that Bob and I agreed to write a script. And the theme was, what is love in the time of genocide? Welcome to Burma today, right? I had written that book, Burma, the Next Killing Fields, the year before that. And I said, you know, those are the, that's the archetype that most touches me. Love in the time of, of extinction. What does it mean to just know that there is no future that we have any recognizable hold on? catastrophic environmental collapse is baked in. Eep, that's what the scientists and you connect the dots tell us. It's in there. Oh, 
damn well better believe in heaven and avoid the concept of hell. I put on the cover here Carl Jung's infamous quote, No tree, it is said, can grow to heaven unless its roots reach down to hell. <laughs> very, very inspiring to want to acquire my book. I mean, I'd be lucky to, to sell 10 and not get 10 despicable reviews on Amazon where they take it down and it, the book goes down into infamy. But it's truth and it's a mandala, like a Tibetan mandala or an Indian Sanskrit mandala. This whole universe, right? Are symbols, invenerating symbols and energy patterns. Mind state constellation patterns. And it's, yeah, there's New York and there's Paris and there's the Buddha and there's Allah and there's the Bible and there's the nuclear armed genocidal dictator Xi Jinping and Sleepy Joe in the White House with all of his, you know, authoritarian nonsense. And we've got the prophet Dr. Anthony Sociopathic Fauci trying to tell the entire world that I'm now God and I had nothing to do with funding and, you know, the gain of function research and the, the, the CCP virus, the Wuhan bio lab that has now been nicknamed by a number of people as the Fauci virus. It's, it's so traceable to him and his colleagues. And this onslaught of authoritarianism coming down the pike everywhere we look, vaccinate, 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 two vaccinates, boost, boost, boost. And next year, vaccinate, vaccinate, boost, 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 variant, vaccinate that one, vaccinate that one, boost, boost, boost. It's like, you might as well get six arms and look like, you know, an Indian goddess, a deity where you just live a life, your dharma is nothing but vaccines. It is so dark, so gallows driven, ridiculous satirical humor. It's like, are you really want us to believe that we should follow your bullshit? I'm not anti-vaxxer, I'm just like anti-bullshit, anti-propaganda. Like I've been thinking for myself since I was like about six, maybe even before I was born. And you want me to believe these fucking idiots coming out of New York and Washington and all these other pundits of profit and privilege and supremacy and Gatesian. This is not conspiratorial anymore. This COVID's real. But this story that they're propagating is so flimsy. It's so pathetic. It's not time to like cower, right? It's so obvious today. Fucking speak out. Riff from your freedom. What? You idiot indoctrination fool. I wouldn't put that crap any more in my body than I would an injection of fentanyl. Oh, uh, really? Uh, you have a QAnon preference? Uh, come on, man. Drop your bullshit. Go hang out in your outhouse of propagandists. But yeah, there's a lot of problems today. The mandala. When I look, I've got a big book in the other room there. Every variation in life is on these mandalas. These, these, and this is a, a literary mandala. It's all about symbols of samsara, identifiable to me, and you're just looking at that. And so be very watchful of, oh, the story, I don't like Bannon, I don't like Peter Navarro, I love Donald Trump no matter what, I'm a... <laughs> That's not the story. Those are just things to inspire like the puppies did. I want to cry in my own sanctity. No, interrupted. I'm out there and all of a sudden, oh my God, I've got a Dhamma epiphany that was like unexpected. May I encourage you? 
I know I'm saying this for my own benefit too, but I'm not. Be willing to take it in and on as a Dhamma journey. It's so disgusting in places with the language, but it's never gratuitous. I'm, you don't know me, but I am so down and comfortable with uber, super, hyper rad language. Sexual language, language up close to violence. It's nothing to the real thing to see someone's head blown off. To see women chained together on the Thai-Burma border, being sold in lots as sex workers in Bangkok. Yeah, that's, you want to, you know, where can I kill? It's just words on a page meant to be a last testament before I take my life. That's all. A mandala. So... I hope it inspires something in you to live as authentically and humanly as possible so that we give the boys and girls in our existing paradigm of life today and the generations to come, there'll be more life even in extinction. Give them the hope, the insight of what it means to be a mad woman and a mad man in a world that wants to suffocate. Fucking, they want to suffocate your freedom. They want to fucking suffocate your creativity. In Burma, they want to persecute, suffocate, and annihilate their dream. That's the evil of dictatorship. That's the evil of totalitarianism. That's the propaganda of delusion inherent even in my own heart. And so. Thank you for letting me and supporting me and hanging in to this rant to fight the good fight. From my heart to yours, thank you. Hope to see you tomorrow, 9.30. Namaste.